welcome to the virtual edition of our year-round screening series, Film Independent Presents. I'm Rachel Bleemer, Director of Events for Film Independent. Before we get started today, I have to give some praise to our loyal supporters. Thank you to the incredible lead sponsor, the Hollywood Foreign Press Association, and our screening partner, Vision Media. Our media partner, the Los Angeles Times. Thank you all. Before we get started today, I'd like to introduce our guest moderator, Artiston's editor for Variety, Jazz Tanke. Jazz, please take it away. Hi, Rachel. Thank you. And thank you to Film Independent and to all the sponsors today. As Rachel said, I'm Jazz Tanke, Artisan's editor for Variety, and I'm thrilled for this conversation. Herself follows the story of a young mother, Sandra, who escapes her abusive husband and fights back against the broken housing system in Ireland. She sets out to build her own home and in the process rebuilds her life and discovers herself. The film is directed by Phila Deloitte and stars Claire Dunn, who also wrote the screenplay. So hi, Claire, and welcome to the conversation. Hello, thank you so much, Jazz. I'm, I'm so excited to dive into this. Um, it has stuck with me for so many reasons. And the one, you know, as I mentioned, you wrote the screenplay. What was the inspiration behind the story? Because it reminded me of the housing crisis that went on in, in Dublin. You know, housing is it has been a huge issue across the UK and across Ireland. So talk about the genesis of herself. Yeah, it was definitely that that kind of sparked it because it wasn't just the problem itself, you know, being like that I could see in the newspapers or on the news. It was that a dear close friend of mine called me when I was auditioning in pilot season, my first ever go at it in New York. And so I was just reading a lot of scripts at the time, learning lines super fast, you know, doing the hustle. And then a dear friend of mine rang and she's a young mother and has always been very independent kind of woman and worked really hard getting her kids through school. And she just had this unfortunate thing happen with the landlord of her home. He, he had to give short notice, like a month's notice, which was happening to a lot of people at the time. But there was literally just nowhere to move to. There was just no houses online available, nothing to rent. So what happens in Dublin and um, to anyone that's in that situation they actually have to go and officially like fill in forms and you're essentially declaring that you're homeless and just that process for her she was just on the phone saying I can't believe I have to do this because I have to cover if there's going to be a gap between when we leave this house and the next and just that process was so she kind of felt ashamed or like a sense of like she failed as a mother and I remember just feeling so um, kind of just, uh, I felt like a sense of injustice about it and that like she shouldn't have to go through this and that I could feel people, like I could feel in her that she feels judged by people, that like she's already a single mother and now she's going to be homeless, you know, like it was this kind of thing going on in her narrative. And I just really felt for her. So then I was sitting there and I was fantasizing that she could build a house by herself and I Googled self build Ireland cheap. And then discovered that there was this guy who built a house for himself for only 25,000 euro. And um, now that would have been about maybe seven or eight years ago. So with inflation, I'd say it'd be about 35 by now. But essentially I was like, that is actually possible. And then I continued for the next year, I was just like learning lines for this like TV series the next day. <laughs> and then suddenly it was like this flash came to me and it was like, oh my God, a woman decides to build her own house for herself and because she helps herself, like it attracts the right kind of help, like not just, you know, social welfare and here's your rent allowance and you'll just be in crap accommodation forever. It was a way of like being independent and starting again. And then because she needs to be getting out of a really tough situation, the for me, it was just almost instant that it was like, I felt like it was a domestic abuse thing and because I'd just been working with a lot of women that had been through through that kind of thing and um, with the work I've done with Phila Deloitte doing, doing workshops in prisons. So it was kind of like a lot of things were going on around me. And as usual, like an idea is a flash, but there's probably loads of ingredients that kind of built up to that moment when you go, oh, I know what the name of the cake is. <laughs> but all the ingredients you were kind of collecting along the way without realizing so yeah so I'd say that was the pinnacle moment though when I when I got the idea 
Wow. Oh my gosh, there's so much to pull from that. But I think, you know, <laughs> what's what was so great is that, you know, as you said, you know, this is a woman who prevails, like, it, you know, and it's such a beautiful story because it happens. Women do make it through, you know, through those situations. Was it, you mentioned seven years, like, is that how long it took to write the story? Um, between... well, yeah, I mean, I got the idea in, in 2014, but I'd say at first it was just me uh, learning how to write and um, <laughs> learning how to, I suppose, think up images or or how it happens. Because writing for film, I feel like is it's like it's almost visual at first or it's, it's a sense. There's a sense of balance between your visual storytelling and then your your dialogue and I suppose I was figuring out my voice with that for a long time and also just like researching like crazy because I didn't realize it was going to be so uh like yeah just research heavy because I then had to look at like family courts and how things work legally with partners and children and then what it actually takes to get planning permission and land and loans of money all of that kind of thing but um, once I started the ball rolling, it was amazing because at first I was literally just meeting people and talking to them. So I met that architect who built that house. I met uh, a woman who was high up in Women's Aid Refuge, but it also just went into this charity shop that, that like fundraises for, or, or they use their profits for um, Women's Aid. And the woman that was in there was actually a woman who has been through something like Sandra in her life. And um, because I went up to the counter and I was just chatting to her a bit and saying, I'm trying to do this film about a woman that goes through this, this process and blah, 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 I told her the whole spiel. And she grabbed me by the arms and said like, oh my God, will you please just tell us a story where we see her get out the other end of it? Because nobody ever shows the battered woman, let's say, like in inverted commas, mm. like but that sort of archetype that we've decided it is. We've never seen her transcend beyond that. Like you seem to always see it just peter out in a story and it's more about other characters and um, have an effect on them, but you never actually get to see them determine their own fate and, and how they actually progress. And so for me, that was just the most important thing, like uh, from the start was shown that Sandra is not, she's not a victim. Mm -hmm. She's actually kind of a, uh, she's kind of a survivor and a bit of a soldier on, on her own war front inside four walls with him. And then she has to make a decision to go. And that's an even more brave decision. And do you know what I mean? I wanted to kind yeah. of show the tone of, I suppose, tender mother and determination and yeah. that tiger mama. It was like, you have to show all these aspects of being a mother and what it actually yeah. takes like and what you'll sacrifice to do, to do something for your kids and um, yeah. yeah sorry I hope I've answered your question I feel like no, I just you did. It on that, there. <laughs> you did that's amazing you talk about the children and they're so integral to the story and to the film and you talk about the tiger mama which you know that opening was was it was just beautiful like how did you crack that opening in writing it and Playing, yeah. that's how you wanted to show her first I would say I um originally I, I tried lots of different openings I think everybody gets a bit obsessed with their openings uh, of a movie especially <laughs> when you're trying to get it funded at the start you want those first few pages to really grab people I would say um it went on a bit of a journey at first like VOs and like um history of Sandra and Gary and so on and so forth but actually then I realized my most important um, desire was to actually just show the little universe she has with her two girls that she's kind of kept safe. Like it's this beautiful thing. And I think I, I sort of realized I wanted it to, the film to begin with them in their little world they've created even within a tough situation. Mm -hmm. and, and then, and you know, show it through the film obviously and then also kind of end with them. And um, I think I realized that at some point in the early drafts and I was like, oh, yeah, that's the way to go. And then eventually it was actually just only when only when Philida came on board and all the financiers and producers were on board. And um, and then it was just like um, once it was clear that, oh, I'm actually going to play Sandra. That was when we introduced the aspect of like the few lines about my birthmark, because A, we needed to kind of go right 
we, we might need to explain it because we don't want to spend the whole, the whole movie covering it up. But B, it's just ironic that Claire happens to have a birthmark that looks a bit like a black eye. And we're showing a woman <laughs> that's coming out of a very violent situation. So it was just to also differentiate between that as being an injury and then part of who she is. And then it got weaved in further on when it was like she was trying to cover it up and tidy up her looks for the court and then takes it off. It took me a while to kind of like get used to that myself because obviously I'm just a writer and an actress. I just want to do my job and keep myself out of the way. But when it's something that uh, needs to be cleared up for clarity's sake, you kind of have to give in, you know, because yeah. with storytelling, I think Philida and I are pretty obsessive about inclusion, like an all inclusive story, but also a really clear story. Like you want somebody who's never even seen a movie before to get it. like that's what we're about, like, you know, so I suppose it was just being very clear from the off. I love that. And you and Philida have worked together before in theatre. You know, you've got a relationship. You do a lot for social justice. Um, how did you actually approach her to direct the movie? Um, at first, it was actually she heard uh, a rumour in the grapevine of the cast. <laughs> that, like, we were doing a, a female trilogy uh, of plays and um, sorry, Shakespearean kind of plays that were set in a female prison and we all had really good bond with each other and got on very well and then somebody mentioned to fellow you know Claire is writing a script like a movie script and um and they kind of described it to her briefly and then she was like she's that sounds really good and they were like yeah she said it's going to have a really good role in it for a great uh, screen actress and then Philida was always like yeah herself like that used to be her <laughs> her joke her little calling card um and at first I actually just, um, she said, can I have a look at it? And I was like, oh my God, yeah, of course. Like I'd, I'd love your, your advice on it or how to get it made. So um, she gave me some notes on a draft at one point and they were really amazing notes. And then further on when I was just in the beginnings of like, I just finished this process where you get a screenplay development fund through the Irish body, like the Irish Film Board, um, which I'm sure you guys have similar things in America. And um, so once I was finished that process, it was about getting it produced and made. And so I already had Sharon Horgan on board. So then I was like, I was uh, talking to Philip and work about it and just going, what companies do you think we should co-produce with and blah, blah, blah. Just kind of asking her questions. And then she asked, could she read it again? And then she just texted me a couple of days later saying, I'm directing your film. And I was like, <laughs> You know, because I actually, in in uh, in all seriousness, I just knew she was really busy and I wasn't sure how or when this film was going to be made. And I kind of just didn't presume that I could ask her. And because obviously the movies she's directed before have been so huge and big budget. But actually, she's so, like, Phyllis is so not, um, she doesn't think like that. Do you know what I mean? She's a very instinctive kind of person and a great artist, but also very humble. And I think for her, she was kind of going, like I've heard her say in interviews now that um, it was actually the idea that she could possibly maybe do something that was more to her taste or do have more control over something because it's actually got a lower budget and just, just have a more collaborative, easygoing approach. Like I say easygoing, I know we shot the thing in five weeks at like, like a crazy, <laughs> a crazy timetable as, as it always is when you're, when you're doing that kind of filmmaking. But for her, that was tremendously exciting. And so it just ended up being a common desire between both of us then. And, and I was just delighted then when she said, I really want you to play Sandra, because I think because of her reputation and her amazing standing in the industry, she was able to say, I actually really want Claire to play it, even though I hadn't much screen experience at that point. She could kind of vouch for me as an actress, yeah. which was just, I mean, talk about a gift from the gods. Like when she was saying that in the meetings, I was like, okay, shoot me down, I'm done. I've, I've made it already and we haven't even started making the film. And so, yeah, that, that was kind of how it went. I, I love that and I can't imagine anybody else now playing Sandra but you but <laughs> once you once you had so, uh, Sandra Philida vouching for you to play the role of Sandra it's something that you've written that's so close to your heart what was it like stepping into the, the shoes of this character that you just created uh, 
Yeah, like, I mean, I suppose an element of it, jazz was like a slipstream. It was kind of like, oh, I'm just going in and I know who she is and I know where it all comes from. Like, it was very, uh, there was this sense of, like, it was quite organic and like, oh, yeah, no, I would know how she does things or how she thinks and and very quickly. But actually, <laughs> because the wonderful Malcolm um, and my, my co-writer, he had the script and was kind of made, lifting it and doing some structural work and kind of co-writing it. Rather, he kind of took the script for like a good nine months, um, like a birth. Um, and then it was given back to me just before we were filming so I could kind of go, okay, here we go and, and have a look at it again. And so actually I did have this weird thing in the first week of like, I kept wanting to rewrite lines. <laughs> <laughs> while we were shooting things and it was like just it was like let it go you know like it was just that thing that was hard in the first few days I was like oh and it's because as the writer you're just used to overseeing all the characters and all their lines and the world of it and what it looks like and what you imagined it to be like so I had to sort of do a little bit of a process in the first week definitely of just letting go of everybody and stop minding everybody and now just mind Sandra, just mind her because actually Phyllida is well capable of, of looking after the yeah. story now. You know, it was just like, yeah. and breathe and let her go. Um, and then it was amazing. It was just fantastic to get in there and, and play her, you know? Yeah. And then give your baby to Phyllida to, to nurture her. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, she's um, a fabulous stepmom. I wouldn't, <laughs> I don't doubt her. <laughs> I love the addition of Sears Titanium. It's such an anthem just in life. And it was an I I, I thought it was an ideal representation of Sandra and for it being a, an anthem. Like, how did you land on that song? And also like getting the rights to that, like how easy. Yeah, um, it's funny because I mean, I wasn't obviously part of every bit of the editing process that's really Philida and Rebecca they they were together on it brilliantly and then I would as the writer you would look at like you know a full-blown attempt at the film and give notes back and so on and so forth they did however go like will you give us Sandra's like playlists and what she listens to and the one thing right from the beginning of my first ever and slightly embarrassing draft um, was that her and her kids always danced to Sia's chandelier. Like that was just this thing. I I loved when Sia released that tune, how it was like her and a like a little girl. And I yeah. thought it was real. There was something about it that was saying something generational about everything that women have fought for for the next generation. There's something about it and like fighting for it for that next little girl that I was, like that I can see this cycle. And I felt like it was the perfect expression of Sandra and how she wants to tell her little girls a different story of the world. And that's why I had this whole thing on, you know, bedtime stories and flipping it and having Emma tell Sandra a bedtime story. It was because just that Sia and the vid the video mm. of that little amazing dancer, like I just was like, okay, there's just something in this about the 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 girl the woman now passing something on to the little girl and so then when they were in the editing process and that I was I sent them a playlist of Sandra's kind of stuff like and lots of Dublin artists and different things that I was thinking that like oh she probably hear this on the radio she probably hear that off they went but they were the ones that found they thought oh feck it like titanium and we tried a mishmash of different songs over that sequence and there used to be like versions where there was like five different tunes and it was coming out of different points on the radio and this that and the other and then eventually it was like everybody was like I think we just need to go for it I think we just need to go for it and it was like okay are we going to be able to get the rights we've already we've already had to fight for the chandelier thing and then um, and then it just happened and I was like is there a magic <laughs> amount of money after arriving or what's going on? And um, so I'm not sure how it was paid for, but I just know that when we had a QA and a in Sundance, there was a woman in the audience that I think is friends with or close to Sia. And she was like, how did you get all these things? And she was like, because I have a feeling Sia knows what the film's about and that she really thought, yeah, girls, here you go. And I was like, oh. 
I hope that happened. <laughs> <laughs> but I think also it's like important sometimes to let's let's well like with indie films, I think um I think like I, I know there's always like beautiful there was great composed music in it as well, which I love as well, and, and live singing and all this kind of thing. Um, and with independent film, there's always kind of like lovely, gentle stuff and great composers. Not all, all of them, but I just think there's always interesting choices. And I thought like, wow, like actually, yeah, let's go for a big, fat, like pop anthem tune yeah. <laughs> and just go for it. Because then um, she would have been blasting that in her ears while she's cleaning and doing stuff. Yeah. And I was like, yeah, why not? Like. I, I remember hearing the cranberries in the movie and I was like, oh, what a throwback. That was such a cool tune. <laughs> Um, yeah. the film you know we talk about housing in the film and, and that issue is addressed it's so strange to be watching that film during the pandemic you know with housing with homelessness beings an issue like what does that what is it like for you because obviously you wrote this way before the pandemic and yeah. um to have it come out now in this time like it just packs that yeah, I mean, I was actually always worried that my film would be out of date by the time it came out. And then, um, like, like genuinely, I, I suppose I was hoping it would be in a way, but um, I, th I still find it fascinating that in the Western world or the, the, the countries that we feel are, we're rich and we're developed, we're still not covering the whole food, shelter, water, education thing. Like, I find that a bit baffling. And I wish it was just, of course, all around more fair. But when when I when this pandemic hit and everything that was going on and the statistics of women ringing helplines in certain situations or men as well or trans like people in abusive or coercive um, relationships were suddenly trapped in whatever home they are with the person they couldn't not face the problem anymore. But also just uh, the homeless crisis has been, it's funny how when a lot of people have to suddenly shift and make a change because there is an emergency situation, they actually do. So they had a lot of homeless people suddenly in hotels being looked after because it was too cold or whatever it would be in certain countries. And I was kind of fascinated by the change of behavior that could be made uh, quite quickly when we want to. And I kind of just go, I wonder can we come out the other side of these things with drastic changes in policy and where we put the money and um, and how we do things because if we can do it fast because suddenly we realize we are losing people on the planet well then I wonder like could we realize how we're losing people on the planet anyway because of homelessness and hunger and um, so yeah I just I just hope that post the really tough stage of this and as we begin to re-emerge into a half normal, you know, coming back to things that that it that we maybe adopt some new measures because we were pretty good at like speedily changing things when we had to. Yeah. Sandra is such a beautiful character. Herself is a beautiful film. It's a story of empowerment. <laughs> what do you want people to take away from this after they watch the movie? Uh wow, that's a good question. Like I think I just love people to realize that if you're going through something huge and you feel so scooped out of energy and have nothing left, that um, it is always possible to be redeemed. Like it's always possible. I think redemption is one of the biggest, um, uh, for me, the most moving things about being a human being is like that we can, we can almost bring people back to life. Um, and I think I'd love people to take away that, like just a sense of hope, despite the, the craziness going on. And, and also, yeah, like redemption and hope, but also just that sense of like, if you feel like you're in a situation like hers, in any sense, and um, just know that there are lighthouses out there. You, there are people, there are helplines, there is somewhere to just reach out to if you can be brave enough to do that safely and um, then do it that's what I really hope that's beautiful Claire mm -hmm. Gunn thank you so much for that conversation thank you to Film Independent and all the sponsors that was so great I could talk to you for, forever Claire <laughs>
and hear about your process <laughs> in this but that was great thank, thank you so much thanks so thank much you. and congratulations again